Okay, we're recording live. And Darren, why don't you tell people a little bit about who you are? And, uh, you know, I saw your TED Talk. And I was so impressed. I had to, had to reach out to you right away. But why don't you talk a little bit about who you are and, and what it is that you teach? Okay. In, in a nutshell, let's see if I can do it in a nutshell. <laughs> I had awesome. 10, year, yeah, 10 years of experience in social work. So my undergrad education is social work. My first job out of that um, was in a psychiatric hospital. So my plan at the time was then to proceed and get a master's and become a clinician. But I kind of had a lot of question marks during my experience working at the psychiatric hospital. Mm -hmm. I was really looking for what's actually an independent variable that I can see and observe that's helping people. And it, it's still kind of a question mark. Now that was late 80s. Um, and I think that the mental health world has recently, maybe in the last five to 10 years, really, um, what would you say, caught up or starting to incorporate how mindfulness as a skill set can help impact a lot of different ways in which we suffer and struggle. Mm -hmm. So, but that was um, well before the mental health world caught on with this. I moved on and did child abuse investigations. I worked as a community mental health um, case manager. And um, for a variety of reasons, what, what I would say about those 10 years was that during those 10 years, I was never really given any skills for taking care of myself, for setting boundaries, for knowing um, what people, when sometimes people need to learn and grow without being rescued, how do you navigate mm -hmm. that if you're the professional helper? And mm -hmm. I saw a lot of burnout going on around me. I, I do not call what happened to me burnout. Burn, I did not burn out. I, we have this thing in the mental health world. You're always setting goals for someone else's treatment, so their improvement, and you say that you want them to gain insight. Mm -hmm. um, and so I said, when I left, I said, I'm not burned out, which you could just, it's kind of splitting here. <laughs> um, <laughs> It was a, but I said, I'm, I've gained insight that this is not sustainable for me and I've got to find something else. So I left the mental health world and um, got a master's degree in library science. And at the same time as I was getting further in my education, uh, I discovered mindfulness at that time, kind of naively went to a silent retreat in North Carolina. And That's a big first step. <laughs> it was a big first step, very naive, because I thought the hard part was the not talking, which I don't think I'm alone with that, um, mm. that assumption. But the not talking was not, <laughs> I love to talk. The not talking was not a problem. The meditation itself was extremely challenging. I think mm. people don't realize it's um, a vigorous, it's, it can be a really rigorous um, endeavor. So, but that was October, 2002. I've been practicing every day since then. And we can talk a little bit about why I think that consistency is there. Mm -hmm. But, um, so I had some jobs doing research with my master's in library science. And at some point after I had a few years of um, my own mindfulness practice, about five years, I'm in the middle of the country. So I'm in Columbus, Ohio. And um, I was very aware that there's a lot of teachers, but they tend to be on the coasts. And mm -hmm. instead of kind of wringing my hands and worrying that there's no teachers where I am, I started to kind of nudge myself into that teacher role. So starting out really small about eight years ago, trying to share what I um, was practicing, what I was learning with people. And that's just kind of grown into this thing where recently I've made, tried to make this my uh, full time endeavor where I'm a freelance speaker, teacher, personal training coach, all around the idea of skills of attention. I call mindfulness attentional fitness, trying to um, help demystify uh, a lot of the concepts. I think it's an extremely practical skill set and mm. it, there's a lot of room for clarification of what it really is. So this is an opportunity to do that. I, I appreciate it. Well, the, I think the attentional what am i getting here oops now i can't hear you oh, oh there you go i'm getting an echo all of a sudden feedback maybe i've got earbuds in so maybe someone has a speakerphone on or a oh i think i know what it is okay 
I had the web page open for the um, ah. site. <laughs> so we were listening to ourselves. Sorry about okay. that. Um, I think that was something that really attracted to me to what you said, you know, the idea of attentional awareness and, and just the idea of being aware of what's happening right now, this specific moment. Um, I think people overthink yep. meditation when they're not on, a, you know, a silent retreat, which, yeah. okay, now you're not overthinking it. It's really, uh -huh. <laughs> but you don't have to constantly be in a meditative zone. It's more about, you know, okay, I'm washing the dishes. I'm just washing the dishes. Right. Is that kind of where you go with that? Oh yeah, definitely. And, and I think it's really subtle. It's a really, what we're talking about is getting familiar with your own subjectivity, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, but what people hear when we try to describe it, there's a couple of things. Once you realize how empowering and truly liberating it can be, then you're trying to sing the praises of the benefits. And mm -hmm. the benefits can be things like reduction of stress or sleeping better or feeling more relaxed. But those are, those are outcomes. So the exercises themselves are really about digging into, paying attention to attention, mm -hmm. um, getting really familiar with what it is, what it, what's the direct experience of being you. Uh, and how do you not navigate the um, basically senses and perception? How does what's it like to take in the world through your eyes and ears and feel sensations in your body, taste things, smell things? What's it like to think? What's the relationship between those things? What's the relationship between seeing the world around me and turning my attention to mental images when I'm remembering the past or thinking about the future? Mm -hmm. So, and in this way, that's one example, but in this way, what we're really doing is turning our attention towards our own awareness, towards our own ability to pay attention through our senses, through our perceptions, through what's happening at any given moment. Mm. And while the outcome can be pleasant, the work itself is, I would say, mostly not super pleasant. Um, it's like, I, I compare it to physical fitness. It's very much like what we know is required when we decide to exercise our bodies. We have realistic expectations about that at this point. But when it comes to mindfulness and meditation, we are still kind of hoping that if I'm doing it right, my mind is clear, my body is relaxed, there's no agitation or boredom. But in reality, the practice itself includes a lot of that. And that's not evidence that you're doing it. None of that's evidence that you're doing it wrong. You just have to adjust your expectations about what is it that you're doing. And if it's becoming really familiar with your own subjectivity, then everything counts. Mm. It's just trying to be clear about how to how to go about um, in real time experiencing that to, as being directly true, not just uh, conceptually appealing. Mm. So you mentioned earlier that you know regular practice was important to you. So how does how does one start that? How does one start to be a little more? I don't want to say the word religious, but be a little more religious about sitting down and practicing in addition to being attentionally aware during the day. Okay. So actually what I do is I kind of flip this. There's a lot of messages out there. I kind of flip it upside down. So I think what people tend to hear is they get the message that they should practice for maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes a day. Uh, first thing in the morning when the things are relatively quiet. Um, and then what happens is if you stick to that kind of a daily momentum, then you'll start to realize you can check in in similar ways in the midst of your ordinary routine. Mm -hmm. I actually recommend people um, start with the pausing throughout the day because it helps you realize that um, the meditation you do with a timer some people do it first thing in the morning. Some people do it at night. This is like going to the gym, gym and it's, it's not so that you can get really good at sitting still. It's that so you can get better at paying attention to your life as you're living it. Mm -hmm. So 
if you if you try to add this thing where I'm going to sit for 20 minutes in the morning, very often people give up. They misinterpret their experience. But if you start by finding places that are moderately challenging throughout the day to just pause and notice. They don't have to be challenging, but it tends to be what brings people to this is the challenging stuff. It can also be pleasant stuff. But what's it like to um, wait for your computer page to load or when you're you find yourself at a red light in traffic or or you're at a boring meeting there's these all these opportunities we habitually default to problem solving narrating fixing micromanaging the world in our imagination mm -hmm. so there each of these becomes an opportunity to pause and and ch check in with your senses what does it feel like to be in a boring meeting what's it feel like to be in a productive meeting what's it feel like to have an answer to a problem that people are discussing, but they don't seem to be open to hear it. What's that actually feel like? So to bring it back to the question, what I, what I hope people will do is, is instead of trying to add one more thing like, oh, I should exercise, I should meditate, it becomes, huh, a question mark. I wonder what happens if I start to pause throughout the day. The, the way I look at it, this is a longitudinal study, like the rest of your life. There's no rush to try to force yourself to sit down a, on a cushion every morning, even for um, 15 minutes. But when you start pausing, you start noticing, you know what? These pauses could be more effective and efficient and productive if I was strengthening the skills required to do that, to pause, just to simply mm -hmm. pause for a few seconds. So then I start to say, what if I try five minutes most days of something timed? So the idea is you want to do something that's sustainable that you can commit to for the long haul. So instead of shooting for 20 minutes at first, I have people who have started with one minute two minutes a day in the, in the uh, pursuit of what we're talking about when you, when you realize there's no rush, mm -hmm. um, I can nudge it up a few seconds. What if I practiced formally for two minutes in the morning? When I say formally, I just mean with a timer. Um, <clears throat> what if I tried that for a month and then decided two minutes is good or I wanna bump it up to three minutes? Uh, the other thing I would say on this is that it doesn't have to be that what you what we picture in our minds is someone sitting in a lotus position or on a cushion or something official um, in complete silence. What if what if you could do something that you're already doing, taking a shower or having a cup of coffee and just decide for this month every day when I do that activity, that activity that doesn't really require me to think and solve I do think and try to solve, but what if I forego that that um, problem solving? And if I'm in the shower, what's it like to, what are the sensory experiences? The hot water hitting my body, the smell of my shampoo. Um, when the shower's over, at least where I am, it's suddenly very cold when the shower. <laughs> so again, all of that counts and that can become a really good bridge into this idea of pausing, but pa but suspending your story for a little bit longer mm -hmm. and kind of gently steer yourself in the direction of going to the gym. What, what I call going to the gym, which is deciding, okay, for the next five, 10 minutes, I'm going to notice physical sensations, or I'm gonna notice my breath, or I'm gonna listen to sounds around me. And I'm gonna try to sustain that for that duration until my timer goes off. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say, instead of trying to be a disciplined person, see if you can get clever and sort of outsmart yourself, because just like with physical fitness, you're not going to want to do this when the opportunity arises. Mm -hmm. uh, logically, it seems like I'm subtracting 10 minutes, five minutes from my day. In my experience, you are actually increasing the quality of the remaining time. It's so much worth, it's worth so much more than that 10 minutes of subtraction. You're adding something, but it's, an, it's you're adding something intangible. You're adding a skill that's um, 
uh, it doesn't show up on the balance sheet, right? Uh, of how you're, how you're budgeting your time. Yeah. You know, I find it, I, I love the idea of triggers, you know, okay. Every time I pick up my coffee mug, I'm going to take, you know, a minute Yeah. and just think. Um, I think for me, when I first started meditating, it was in the seventies uh -huh. and I had like, Somebody told me, you know, you're just going to get a candle flame and you're going to stare at that candle flame until something really yep. happens. I thought I was going to go blind. <laughs> and the whole thing made me crazy because uh -huh. I didn't know enough about it to understand why I was doing what I was doing. And it took me a long time to really understand that really I'd been practicing mindfulness all along. I just didn't realize it. That's right. And it's such a revelation to me and I've seen it, you know, you see people's eyes light up and go, what the hell? I've been doing that all along. Yeah, that's right. You're not doing it consistently, right? Or, inten or intentionally, but yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You're not doing it consistently. And intentionally. And also, I also think we discount it when we do it because I think we do expect it to be harder maybe than it is. It has this weight of what would you say spirituality or it's got this mythic um it's also seems like something that everyone else it always feels like i'm the only person who struggles with this i'm the only person <laughs> whose mind race everyone's telling me all the time oh my mind races i can't do I think, mm -hmm. well, you think I'm doing this because my mind doesn't race? Like, <laughs> like I do, I do think you, you think I took this on because I was so relaxed and this mm -hmm. is, oh no, this is not easy for me. Um, it's still not 13 years later. It's not, it's not easy. It's as slippery for me as it is for anyone else. But so is going to the, like going to the gym. It's okay. It's freezing cold here. And if I'm going to get exercise, I have to make my way to the gym and hop on a treadmill, which I do not enjoy. I don't enjoy. <laughs> For one thing, there's the, all these TV screens with like eight different news channels. And mm -hmm. I, so it's complicated. So I have to trick myself. I have to find ways to trick myself because I never regret hopping up on the treadmill and going for whatever. 15, 20 minutes, but uh -huh. I never want to. And mm -hmm. I think it's the same thing. If it physical exercise is such a great place to go when you're wondering, am I doing this right? Is my experience right? Is my experience valid? If you compare, what if this were, what if this didn't have the weight of spirituality or uh, stress reduction even? What if it were just a skill set, an exercise? Mm -hmm. Exercise is challenging. Always. Uh, right. Um, and what you're talking about the the candle, the, what it reminds me of is people who have been exposed to a variety of different meditation options. What I like to say is um, that there's no one right way. That's that's the difference, I think, in my approach and the teachers that I'm drawn to are it's that it doesn't matter if it's a candle or the sound of the ocean or the sound of birds or the sounds of traffic. Why can't I listen to sounds in a busy street corner in New York City? That's still sound. Whether the sound is spiritual or not is something I'm adding. It's content. It's a judgment. It's an evaluation. I'm, I'm trying to notice my subjectivity, my senses. So the sound itself is irrelevant. Even what if the even if the space I'm in is completely silent, that's not more spiritual than if it were loud, um, because the the task is how do I get to know myself better directly through paying attention to my own awareness. Mm -hmm. So the context. Uh, it just sells more tickets to have like a statue of the Buddha or some incense or some temple bells or some stacked rocks. Right. But mm -hmm. none of that, that's all just content. It doesn't matter what we're, um, what we're working with. You can, if you can see or hear or feel, then what you're seeing, hearing, feeling matters less than the fact that you're really noticing how you're taking the world in. How you're yeah. That's, it. that's really the key, right? It's, yep. It's make, first it's intention yep. that I intend to pay attention. And then it's actually noticing. That's and right. It doesn't mean that you have to judge that or you have to weigh it. I think that's the other thing that people get caught up in yep. is that they will, um, you know, okay, 
I'm thinking about my breath. Wait a minute. Do I always breathe like this? Oh, yeah, right. God, I'm hyperventilating, then it's all over. You know, we get into analyzing how we're doing things. And that's not the point. It's that's really right. about, you know, just paying attention. I don't know if you know the app um, Budify. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love this app because it's wonderful in that it's meant to do at work in your office. Right. Maybe you're going to go to a meeting in a few minutes. It's a very short time period and it's guided meditation. That's and right. I think that that type of guided medicaid that type of <laughs> medication oh, is well. a really easy on ramp. That's people. right. You know, and I, and I would say that that ramp could stay the ramp. That's the productive ramp. What, the other thing you reminded me when you said about the candle, how one thing to ask yourself when you're trying any strategy is, was this designed for a monastery or was it designed for my life? Mm -hmm. And if it was designed for a monastery, then you are swimming against the stream. If you are, um, your room Just is jump quiet. Jump in the deep end of the pool and go for it. <laughs> but yeah. And I and actually think that living in a monastery is probably harder than it looks from the outside too. But what? why do we think it has to be silent, right? And why, do, why does it have to involve a candle? If, it, if I can change, if I can soften my resistance to, let's say, boredom or anxiousness in a meeting at work, this is something people complain about, how many meetings they have. If you turn even a portion of your meetings into, include that into your meditation practice, you're going to start in a sneaky way, you're going to find endless opportunities to practice. And that practice counts. Mm -hmm. So the thing there is that what people misinterpret is they think they have to be, let's say, relaxed or has to be pleasant to count. And they tell me, well, I wasn't mindful because I was rushed or I wasn't mindful because I'm feeling stretched or my mind is all over the place. And I say, but you're telling me something about your own subjectivity. You noticed that you were rushed. What if it's just this is what being rushed feels like? Sometimes I'm going to the rest for the rest of my life. I will have situations that involve me having to step it up hurry up, meet a deadline, get somewhere. And noticing that I'm rushing is not in itself a problem. It's like, I, what I think of it is I'm taking a sample, a very small sample, four seconds. Maybe one repetition is about four seconds at the most, maybe two seconds, maybe one second sometime. I'm taking a sample and I'm giving it to my nervous system and say, you know what? I'm not solving this. I'm just giving you some data. Can you help me like sort this out over the long haul? I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep shoveling data into the database. And let's see, because maybe what I find is let's say if I'm rushed, by the time I notice I'm rushed, it's too late to fix it. I've done something, I've procrastinated, I've waited too, you know, I've waited too long to leave the house. Uh, this morning I had a dentist appointment. And I meant to leave a half hour early. I left 20 minutes early. So I'm noticing it's entertaining to think that I can now impact the time space continuum, right? <laughs> how, like, how could I get there faster? I could either devise a, a strategy that no one else has discovered for impacting time, or I can punish myself for being 10 minutes behind schedule. The reality is, that I was there, I was fine. It was fine. I was like, it was like two minutes late. In my imagination, the entertaining story I want to tell myself is that I'm going to walk in late and be embarrassed, and I'm going to have ruined the whole flight pattern for the dental office stuff for the whole day. And the reality is, it was there was zero drama to walking in two minutes late and being in the chair by eight oh five. But so here's the thing. As I'm driving, I don't have to be blissed out and deeply relaxed. Some of that time I'm noticing, hmm, this is what it feels like to be running behind. Note to self, I wonder if I add, give myself a little more time next time. Does it feel, will I feel better if I'm on time? Or do I kind of always feel jittery when I'm on the way to an appointment? For me, 
I'm always kind of, I kind of idle high emotionally. Mm -hmm. So if my goal is I will never feel rattled, then that's not, that's not going to be fun. Because if I give a talk or if I teach a class or if I have a meeting, there's this little bit of, there's a little bit of maybe fear or the potential embarrassment or the being late, but there's also just, it's kind of exciting. It's not, um, it's not smooth water. It's choppy. And that's a sign that I'm alive. Right. And I, if I'm engaged in stuff that I want to do, if I didn't care about being late, then I'd probably be really blissed out and calm all the time. But mm -hmm. since I'm invested, what if, that stuff that we interpret as um, rattled is not problematic at all. Uh, and it's just something to notice. Oh, this is what I feel like when I'm on the way to an appointment. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of turning towards your own subjectivity again. But don't you think too that there is, you know, we're like, okay, I'm going to be late. This is not something that I can change in the time space continuum. So yeah. I'm going to be late. I'm just going to sit with that and be okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. That this is what's going to happen. And I think for myself, you know, when I'm late and I'm often late, <laughs> is that, you know, I can either say, okay, everything's going to be fine. I'm not going to be that late. Traffic's going to be fine. But if I start getting like all fixated on it and, and tight, then I'm going to start to see that, oh, traffic's really bad. and Oh, I'm really yeah. mad at that guy for cutting me off. And you start to wind yourself up and you can change that without saying, oh, I'm going to be all blissed out and everything's going to be great. That's right. Who cares? Right. There's That's a difference right. between who cares and changing your mindset is where I'm going. With yeah, that. no, that's right. And, and what I would say, this is where uh, I think this is the, one of the most common misconceptions is that if I'm doing this right, mm -hmm. I should not have discomfort or confusion. And here's, here's the way to, here's the way to think about this. And it works for, for um, really every situation. Being late is a great one because we can all relate to it, but we have two modes of attention, two primary modes of attention when we're not asleep. Right. And let's say, let's say if we're not um, numbed out, we're not numbing ourselves out in some way. But by default, we tend towards a narrative focus. We see the world as a character navigating a story. This is like from William James. And then in contrast to the narrative focus is a direct focus. So that means I'm actually paying attention to some sensory detail that's occurring right now. So when, a, so when I'm in traffic, I'm a character who's going to reveal that he's a bad character or a, a lacking character because he's not um, a punctual character. And how am I going to solve it? Um, and how many things can I control in the next few minutes? So if my, if my ride to my dentist was like 15 to 20 minutes, it's mostly things outside of my control at that point. So I'm suffering to the degree that I'm trying to uh, change the situation. So the narrative focus is, it's great because maybe I could think of a different route, right? Mm -hmm. But most of the time we sort of, we, once we exhaust the possible ways we could act upon the problem, we just don't know when to stop that. I don't, we don't have a habit for stopping. It's like, okay, wait, I've done everything I could. Next time I'll leave a few minutes early, but here I am and I'm going to be five minutes late. And so instead of having acceptance with, let's, it's not about accepting the traffic or accepting being late. It's this is an opportunity for a few seconds or a few minutes to watch my subjectivity without interfering, which means I have sensations in my body that are communicating that I'm rattled. I have pictures in my mind where I'm imagining, you know, I'm imagining I walk in and the dentist and the hygienist are kind of frowning and disappointed and they're, and they're, they're mad because they're not going to get to eat lunch because I've ruled, I've ruined their whole day. They're basically, their lives. I've ruined their lives. They've never had a late client before. I'm the first one. Mm -hmm. um, or there, or if I happen to get there at 7:59, they're going to love me because I'm such a great, but 
So the tricky part is, and this is this is what I, you know you're practicing mindfulness or you know you're strengthening your skills of attention when you temporarily drop that story, you drop the problem solving and you just watch, look what my body does in this situation. Look what my mind does. Look how my mind and my body work together. So what happens, it's kind of a vicious cycle. I picture their disapproval and disappointment. My body feels tense hot, my cheek, my cheeks feel um, hot, right? I'm embarrassed. Mm -hmm. um, and then I start thinking about other things like, oh gosh, I forgot. This is, I get a shot in the mouth this morning. That's not going to be fun. What's my strategy for? So it's like hanging back as an observer. You're, you're sort of a scientist with having some objectivity. I'm a scientist observing my own subjectivity, right? And noticing, wow, when this guy's running late, he kind of, this is what happens in his body. And look what his look at these pictures in his mind and listen to the things he's saying without trying to fix it because what you're trying to do is gather data um, data that you've collected by not interfering but just by paying attention and what happens is with practice over time when you suspend your story and notice really what's it like to be alive over mm -hmm. and over and over and over again you're increasing your ability to focus to decide what you want to notice you are increasing your familiarity with yourself and when those two things go up this kind of internal friction this constant internal friction now is never good enough i'm never good enough the world's not good enough all that just gradually um starts to erode it nudges down slowly um it just nudges down slowly it's a it's a and it's, it's because of our habitual reaction. It feels like I, need, I have an obligation to fix myself and fix the world or both. And I'm constantly fixing both of those in my mind, in my imagination, you know, driven a lot by emotional sensations in my body. But people tend to come to mindfulness because they think I think too much. I worry too much. I can't stop thinking. I, I'm awake in the middle of the night. But what you start to discover is that the thoughts are also directly connected to these emotional discomforts in the body that's really fueling that compulsive thinking. Mm. Mm, yeah. I want to take a break here real quickly and say, yeah. if anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll address them as we can. So you just type slash Q and then your question um, for Darren or for me, um, I think, you know, the whole idea of mindfulness has all of a sudden come center stage and, you know, okay, I wrote a book. <laughs> but it really, it's something that's very interesting to people. And I think it comes from the fact that so many of us are overwhelmed by our lives and all of the things that we've got going on and the inundation of the noise and how hard we're working and then somebody comes through and says, you know, if you just practiced a little mindfulness, your life would be just glowing and you'd be floating through the universe and right, right, right. fabulous. So let's talk a little bit more about what the real time, yeah. real world benefits are. You alluded to that a little bit, but let's let's go a little more in depth into that, particularly in a work environment. Yeah. How can mindfulness help us. Well, I think what when we think of stress i think it, it helps me to think of stress as being about i feel like i don't have the capacity to respond to some pressure so that's when i'm starting to feel stress is i don't feel like i have what it takes to do what's being asked of me i think, I think that's where we start to really feel it mm -hmm. um and the reality of that is sometimes we're asked to do too much i think it's because if we think about how we're how are we assessing that i think that alone is a really important question mm -hmm. how do i decide when i don't have the capacity to do something a couple of things here i would say this is a a thing i come back to again and again what would it look like if i felt at home in any particular situation or challenge, right? What's it feel like to feel at home? Does that mean I need to be completely comfortable and completely certain? 
because if it does, I'm, I'm really in trouble. But I would say for most of us, this is what we're hoping will happen. I feel comfortable physically and emotionally, and I feel certain. If I feel discomfort or uncertainty, this is not acceptable. And either I'm not good enough or my boss is not the right person or the organization is not the right organization or something like this, right? So when we practice paying attention for even a few seconds or a few minutes, I would say you're strengthening a capacity. You're strengthening a capacity to feel at home in a broader um, range that includes discomfort and confusion. If what if if I can feel relatively comfortable in discomfort, right? Or if I expect that I'm going to be confused and it's not personal, it's just a learning curve, it's just a part. Like, so I had a student recently who started a new job and I loved this comment. He'd only been to a few classes with me, so I was um, really excited. He said, I started this new job. I'm I'm really a stressed out person. It was like the third day. Someone asked me where something was, and I didn't yet know where it was. And I pa I caught myself and stopped and said, "This is what it feels like to be on the job the third day." Mm. And the habitual reaction is, "I should know. <laughs> I should know. Why should? Yeah. <laughs> why shouldn't I? Why should? Why don't I know?" But this is powerful stuff. Um, like someone today is going to ask you to do something and it's very likely that you're not ready to deliver it. So at what point do we habitually decide there I'm, fl I'm a flawed person. Everybody else would know what to do. Mm. But the reality is it's vulnerable to be asked to do something outside your uh, comfort zone. You, you talked about my, my Ted talk, my experience of the Ted talk, was 95% outside my comfort zone and 5% like completely enjoying every minute of the 12 minutes. <laughs> but it was, but I kept telling my, it was actually because this, these students have been recently saying they just paused and noticed this is what it feels, this is what it feels like when your kid's crying and won't go to sleep. This is what it feels like to be asked to do something that I'm not comfortable knowing how to respond to in the workplace. So I, I had like six hours backstage before my talk and I can't tell you how many times I said, this is what it feels like to get ready to go out in front of 900 people. This is what it feels like two hours before. This is what it feels like one hour before. Mm -hmm. And if, I'm gonna, if I waited until that felt comfortable, I would have gone out the back door and left because there was, it wasn't comfortable. Yeah. And I think this happens in the workplace all the time. I, but this is what it feels like to give a uh, presentation. This mm -hmm. is what it feels like to respond to a question. I'm sure this is what it feels like to say, I don't know. Right. This is what it's, this is what it like. It's like to say, I have to prioritize and I can get to that project, but I have to finish this project first. Can we talk about the deadline? Mm -hmm. So it's not about being blissful, benevolent, saint, never feeling stuff, but it's like, how do I not make things worse when I'm uncomfortable and uncertain? And how, what do I nudge internally to sort of, to approximate that? And it's mm -hmm. just a um, learn by doing experience, real life, um, Again, monasticizing your real life. How do I expect that there will be discomforts and uncertainties? And how do I not take those personally and sort of ride them out without making them? We make them worse, right? We make our discomforts worse in our efforts to not have any. By fixing it on them. Yeah. The one thing. Yeah. 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 Uh, Gail had a question, and, and this is a good segue for that. How do you introduce the concept and benefits of being mindful to colleagues, to the people that you're working with? And I, I, what I hear in Gail's question is that you have a colleague who's not mindful. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe. You don't want to be um, the only one in the office. You know, the, I would say the, the, the sort of the news we don't want, the news I don't want to hear, or I don't even want to say it, is the best way to teach someone how to be mindful is to not let them know that you're being mindful, but just be mindful yourself. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a surprisingly powerful way to teach is for them. So how do I, if I have an example. So I had one time there was this, a coworker who, she's the coworker who 
I like to connect, right? So I like to build a bridge. What do we have in common? I'm always trying to find what do we have in common? And she's a person who there's no, there's nothing you can say to build that bridge because she's going to disagree. So if, if you find out she likes something and you compliment it, she's going to disagree somehow. Uh, it's just like, oh, isn't the sky, isn't, oh, it was raining. Now it's clear. Isn't the sky beautiful? Well, it's kind of cloudy, this kind of person, <laughs> right? And she, we, she and I were talking and one time she, she said something to me that was so offensive, but it was, it was so offensive that it was beyond fixing. It was sort of like, I, as she said it, it was something that I value personally that she was mocking. And, but she and I needed to work together on a project. <laughs> and, and, she, and the problem was she didn't see it as mocking. So this is kind of the Gail's question about if someone's not paying attention in this way, uh, it can lead to a lot of problems. But all I could control was, oh my gosh, I could feel this fear and anger and stuff welling up in me. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at her, I'm talking to her, and I'm doing my best to be professional and civil and deciding not to make a debate out of it. But I'm just gonna feel my feelings. And when something like, like that happens to me, I decide this feeling is so strong, I'm not gonna try to solve it with this person right now. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna feel my feelings. When that, let's say that anger subsides down to a moderate level, I'll decide, do I still wanna address this? Or do I have you know other priorities I wanna focus on? But that being said, said I, I would say that it's something about people are always watching us. And if you don't, if you get in the habit of not making discomforts worse, they start to pick up on it. So I think this is much more effective than trying to say, to tell someone else that they should be mindful. Oh, um, yeah. 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 Be mindful. Be it mindful work, yeah, it doesn't that work that way. But <laughs> it does have an effect. I've noticed the mindful person in the group. I would even say if you kind of keep your strategy a secret, the group starts to see you as a neutralizing um, team member. Mm -hmm. They and tend so to use words like, oh, you're so grounded all the time. Yeah, exactly. And so mm -hmm. it's sort of like you're teaching by demonstrating it in yourself. So this is also true for parents who want to know how to ha have their teenagers be more mindful. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. If you want mindful kids, I'm sorry, but the best thing you can do is practice, cultivate it for yourself. It really is such a personal practice. It's something mm -hmm. you're giving yourself and you're training yourself to be resilient so that you need less and less for all your team members to be mindful in order for you to be okay. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I, I think that does make sense, but I think there's also a second way to look at it um, because you know, let's say, for example, you're going into a meeting and it's one of those meetings where there are 900 people in there with, well, okay, 10 people, in there, <laughs> Feels like with, you know, their iPads and their iPhones and their pads of paper, and they all have an agenda coming into the meeting and yep. they all have different agendas maybe than the meeting is intended. And I yep. think if you are in charge of that meeting, you can say, okay, we're all going to totally. take a minute. And we're just going to settle. Everybody put down your stuff and just think about why are we here? That's and what right. do we want to accomplish in this meeting? And then even if you go around the room and say, why are you here? Why are you here? What do you want to accomplish? I think that's a way to lead people to mindfulness without saying, you know, you're going to be mindful in this meeting or else. Yep. You know, I think. Oh, that's right. That's right. I also think that you can, there's such a growing body of research. You can also have ways of, you know, you can share information. If Harvard Business Review is quoting research studies about more productive meetings that mm -hmm. are partly because of what you're describing, like, or what's um, Sherry Turkle's new book about reclaiming conversation, where she says, even having a cell phone turned off and sitting on the table reduces the connection you feel in a conversation. There's things like this that you can, you can sort of decide ahead of time, you know what, we're gonna try an experiment and we're going to make the meeting shorter and we're going to ask that everybody refrain from checking email and texting during that meeting. It's sort of like, how can we strategize and experiment? And it, it becomes not about like any, you know, pointing the finger at any one person, but saying, mm -hmm. um, how can, does anyone have any ideas that what would it take for you to give your full attention to this? 
and what are some ways we could do that? And you know, I think a lot of times making those meetings shorter and mm -hmm. making sure there's an agenda, people are comforting themselves because they're bored or maybe they don't belong in the meeting, right? Um, so there's, there's, it's a complicated puzzle, uh, but it's one worth exploring. And I think you're right about those points. It's definitely a complicated puzzle because, you know, I mean, how many meetings do we sit through where we really could be there for two minutes and we have to sit through the whole thing because we have yep. to the whole roster. My so think, you know, things like standing and walking meetings are right. a much better way to focus. Um, right. But, you know, I, I think, too, that by setting the stage and then also actually listening to that's people. right. You know, if, if you're leading the meeting or you're just a participant, paying, giving each individual your full attention and right. there for them uh, carries over way past the meeting because people right. are like, wow, somebody actually listened to me in a meeting. That's right. And there's ways to listen so that people feel heard. And sometimes I feel like it's, it's like you said earlier about overthinking. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just we think people are asking us to solve a problem and sometimes they're just trying to be heard. Yeah. And that's a really imp important um, thing to actually call out. You can say, you can even say, is it okay if we don't solve this right now? And the, you might be surprised the person is, oh yeah, I don't, I'm not expecting a solution. Um, but you're right. People want, people so rarely get anyone's full attention right now. Um, but yeah, I do think there's ways to rethink the design of a meeting and how do we, do we re does it really need to be an hour just because that's a convenient way to book it on my calendar? Mm -hmm. Or um, maybe this is two 20 minute meetings with like only four people each instead of two hour long meetings with 10 people. Mm -hmm. I think this is a, ongoing thing everywhere i think i hear i get lots of laughs when i talk about boring meetings um, <laughs> but i know it's an ongoing problem everywhere <laughs> huge <laughs> it's especially huge for somebody like me who works from home so i'm always on conference calls how do i not get on email or tweet right. or whatever while people That's are going right. on and on about things that don't matter to me um right and I think one of the one of the tricks that I use in those kind of meetings is to try to uh, actually listen and try to understand what the person is saying and, and get to know them better without, yep. you know, being too, as as Laura says, woo woo about it. Um, yeah, right. You know, just being that. The, if you actually listen and you ask one single question, sometimes it just blows people away because they aren't That's right. to being listened to. Oh, like a relevant question. I, one thing that's surprisingly pre, or effective is literally turning into the sound of someone's voice as they're talking. And if it's a particularly boring or um, unsettling speaker, mm -hmm. listening for the pauses between what sentences, listening for commas and periods can really, it can become a game you're playing that people don't know you're playing, but they feel more heard as you're doing it. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend this for when the stakes are lower, right? Where the content's not that, um, you're not being asked to create something or respond or solve a problem, but someone's just got the floor, someone's got the mic, it's not your turn to talk and it's kind of boring to you. Listen for commas and periods and see how that conserves your energy. So that so the goal there is I want to get out of this meeting on the other end, not resentful and feeling like I've wasted my time. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of relaxation that you could sneak. Um, and this game you can play, you know, the, the reality is people don't know. The person doesn't know how to be more interesting either. You know, it's a, it's hard to be the person who's being asked to facilitate a meeting that's not necessary. So instead of making an enemy of, out of that person, how can I sort of soften my reaction to them? Um, mm -hmm. And in general, I think this kind of goes to, um, even back to Gil's question a little bit, one of the most interesting insights, it's not exactly a mindfulness insight, but it's in the, it's in the family, is when someone else feels they're like they're my opponent, how can I, instead of making them my opponent, treat the, the breakdown of communication between us as our mutual opponent? So how can I convey to this person 
um, that I'm on the same side as they are against some common problem. So the problem itself or the misunderstanding itself is our, our shared obstacle, where I think in the workplace it's really easy to decide this person is my enemy. <laughs> this person, I'm up against them, and how do I get rid of them or how do I convince them that they're wrong? Mm. But it's more like how do I, how do I address this communication breakdown between us? Um, that makes us feel like opponents. It's a tricky one, but it's something to be on the lookout for in a lot of different uh, work contexts, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes I sense. I think that as, a, as an employee, I have felt a boss not hear me because I think they were, they were thinking I'm trying to um, win. Like, right, it's you against me. But I'm saying, no, I just wanna know that you're on my side against this obstacle like so for example i need help you i've got too many tasks and 20 tasks is too many to prioritize are these five the one are we on the same page that these five priorities are are what i should be working on and it's sort of like it's kind of like you're talking to a parent and the parent doesn't want to condone that you don't take all 20 priorities seriously so they're not willing to say, okay, yeah, let's let's make sure that these top five. And you know, maybe they don't know. But what I was asking is, I'm not asking you to solve my problems. I'm not asking you to um, let me get away with not doing anything. I just want you to. I want to know that you and I are on the same side against the problem of having too many priorities. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's a it's a tough one, but I think there. How do I? How do I communicate that that's what I need? And sometimes you have to just ask. I'm not asking for you to solve my problems. I want to. I want to know that we're that you're on my side. Or and just that I want to want to know that you are aware. That's of right. What this issue is, and that I'm right. not going to flake on it. But right. here's what I'm going to do first. And you know, right. I mean, if you can that's show right. them what your game plan is, then generally they will be on your side. Right. Um, it's just that man. tricky part in the workplace where you have what you've considered your seventh priority. Mm -hmm. You're suddenly being asked to re like report on how's that coming. You're like, well, <laughs> that's lower. Here's what I have. Can we talk about what I have accomplished? And then if if number seven needs to be moved to number one or two, let's let's be clear about that. And that's you know obviously a two way street, mm -hmm. um, but. Mm -hmm. As we kind of wrap up the show here, do you have maybe a couple of tips that we can leave people with to just take that moment to be a little more mindful in their life without feeling like they have to judge it or worry about it? Right. Or, you know, by God, they have to do it. How can we slowly work into being more mindful in our, our day to day lives? So I want to give two points that I think would really help people. One is to keep, I really recommend keeping this to yourself. You talked about the woo-woo. It doesn't take much to see woo-woo in the workplace. Mm -hmm. This is a relationship you're having with yourself. It will impact the relationships you're having with other people. But let this, I, I really recommend this book by David White, W-H-Y-T-E, The Three Marriages, and I won't go into it, mm -hmm. but it's basically saying that you have commitments to yourself, maybe to one other person and your career. And this is not a work-life balance thing, but more like a messy conversation between the three. And um, so the part that I feel like we get so little instruction is how do I cultivate a relationship with myself? And I think mindfulness or attentional fitness is a perfect way to do this. And it just simply means how can over the next days, weeks, months, years, I notice what it's like to be alive more regularly through my senses and not make a big deal out of it, not overthink it. And the second point is let everything count in this exploration. So it's not that you get points for noticing relaxation and you get points taken away for noticing that you're rushing or anxious or bored or sad. It's that you get points for noticing anything, for hearing a sound, for 
seeing what's on the road in front of this is a good one and in, in your car please look at the road <laughs> <laughs> and notice what it feels like to drive and pay mm -hmm. attention to your surroundings i think this is going to become a bigger and bigger issue for us as a society that we don't pay attention when we drive anymore mm -hmm. anyway but see the road see watch the traffic light hear sounds hear your children's voice listen to people talking in a boring meeting feel bored it's it's as if you're asking a question what does it feel like to see what's it feel like to hear what's it feel like to experience my emotions in my body there's endless opportunities you don't have to take advantage of all of them but can you sort of work in the direction of sneaking 10 to 15 minutes of yourself time for yourself it doesn't have to be all in a row right so maybe five minutes in the morning and then 10 minutes throughout the day one minute at a time um, taste the first bite of your meal drink taste the first sip of your coffee and let all of this count this is what it feels like to be worried about an upcoming meeting it's like you're how can I trick myself into noticing that I'm alive and make that a habit. Mm. And even everything counts. My mind is scattered. That's worth noticing. My mind is scattered. What's it feel like to have a scattered mind? Are there pictures in my mind? Are there words? Are there both? Is there an emotional component? It's when we're in therapy, we're talking about fixing a narrative. When you're practicing mindfulness, you're, you're, increasing your intimacy with yourself with your own self-awareness and this is the, the core this is the essence of emotional intelligence um self-awareness and it's it's a different kind of self-awareness than than the analytical conceptual understanding the character in a, in a movie or in a story it's oh yeah this is what it feels like to be alive this is what children do instinctually but adults get out of the habit of doing because everything has to have a meaning and an answer and has to work in the direction of comfort and certainty. But this is what it feels like, you know, when, when, when I talk about feeling at home, in your home, sometimes you're sick, sometimes it's cold, sometimes there's arguments, but it's your home. And you find a way to work your way back to some kind of a homeostasis. And you don't say, oh, I don't like my home because sometimes we argue. You say, having a home is complicated being alive is complicated right mm -hmm. and um can i there's a kind of home of being in a hotel camping um whatever we know how to do this what do i need to do to say that this is enough even if something needs to be resolved this is my life and even though i've got a problem to resolve there's going to be another problem to resolve after this one so can i kind of quit fighting with myself on a habitual basis mm -hmm. and um, accept that there's discomfort, accept that there's uncertainty and include all those discomforts and, and uncertainties into your mindfulness exploration. It's going to be so much more fun and productive when you, when you go that route. And think of all the extra time you're going to have. <laughs> <laughs> and you really will. And more energy because you're not, Fighting with yourself takes a lot of energy mm -hmm. and we do it compulsively. We all do it. It's a very, it's just a uh, difference of degrees. We all do it. We fight with ourselves in ways we wouldn't maybe fight with other people, but we do it habitually. I'm never good enough. Um, the world, you know, I need to fix the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just taking that extra moment to say, okay, I'm judging myself again. And then not judging yourself for judging yourself, but saying, okay, I recognize that I'm doing that again, Yep. you know, what, and, and just turning your attention. Off. What's judging? What does judging consist of? And I've learned. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, this has been wonderful. And I, I really enjoyed our chat. I also want to let people know where to find you. Okay. Uh, they can certainly watch the Ted talk on the blog at mindfulsocialmarketing.com, but why don't you let people know how they can find you and, and maybe engage you? Okay, and if you go to athomeinyourlife.com, that's my website and I have a blog there. I share, since I do have this uh, background as a librarian, one of my favorite things to do is to point people to books and um, podcasts and things. So I, I, I post a lot of excerpts. I also post a lot of instructions 
on my blog. So things about how to work with, how to turn listening to music or watching movies or exercising, how any of these things can do double duty as mindfulness exercise. And it's all about um, cultivating skills of attention. So at homeinyourlife.com, I'm on uh, Facebook and Twitter and all the usual places too. So I look forward to connecting with people. Yeah, this the hour really flew by. So I really appreciate <laughs> the invitation. Good. So <laughs> yeah, and you can tell I have no problem talking. So you can see what a challenge a uh, silent meditation retreat would be for me, but I, I still do it. <laughs> I haven't been able to go to that extreme yet either. And I'm, I'm not sure, like you said, I'm not sure if it would be actually the silence that would be the problem as much as the sitting and the rigor. And yeah, the rigor. It's, it's, um, it's rigorous to uh, notice what's happening and instead of entertaining yourself or comforting yourself, which is what we do. Uh, but it's powerful stuff. So I, I do encourage people, if you have an opportunity to do it for a day or a weekend, um, it, it, I'll say this final thing. In physical fitness, we know just because someone is winning Olympic medals is no excuse for you not to, like let's say as a swimmer, just because someone wins gold medals in the Olympics as a swimmer doesn't mean you can't go swim at your own pace in your own um, set of circumstances and challenges. Mm -hmm. Same with running and all these things. We know this about physical fitness. Start where you are, let that be good enough. Let everything count. If it were, if it were physical exercise, how would you approach it? And let that help you um, navigate some of this. Let it be uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to take the stairs. It's uncomfortable to notice your thoughts and feelings. It's all really worth doing and you will not, you won't regret it. You won't regret it. And the more you can make it a habit, the less you'll regret it. So absolutely. So good luck to everyone. Keep in touch. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to pause the recording.